The year was 1983. Screaming in the Night by Crocus had hit number 21 on the charts. Diana was gestating in the womb. And Leon of Mojave had a life-altering choice to make between two friends named Jim. Jim of Light and Jim of Darkness. Could playing cards and telepathy be just the trick to guide Leon's path? Or are all of these things just magical coincidences? Confused? You won't be after this episode of Homespun Hates. Hello, hated loves. Welcome to Homespun Hates. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And we're back. (laughs) Welcome to season five. Ooh. That feels good, doesn't it? It does. Slip into something more season five-y. Mm. We are so thrilled to be back. We took the month of January off. I'm sure you missed us, but we're here now, ready to fill your ears with more spooky, terrifying, and sometimes hilarious stories about ghosts, ghouls, haints, elementals, and other willy-nilly creepy things. <laughs> oh, but you know who didn't miss us, Becky? Who, Diana? Our patrons. That's right. Our patrons <laughs> got to receive continual content from us through January. And we have three patrons we would like to give a shout out to who joined recently. Yes. We would like to give a big shout out to Ella. Thanks so much, Ella, for joining our Patreon Ella has actually been on our episodes in the past. She has some ghost stories of her own, and we've met up with her in person, so we're really delighted that you're here, Ella. Also, we have a woman who goes by the name of Witchy Poo as our patron. I love that. I'm incredibly jealous. Wish I'd thought of that. Yep. That's a great handle. Thank you so much for coming. And then also, shout out to Alana for upping her tier. So thank you, guys. Alana's been a patron of ours for, gosh, since the beginning. So we are really, really thrilled that all of you are here. We hope you're enjoying all of the extra spooky content that we're dishing out every week for you guys and you guys alone and also receiving these episodes ad free. One thing we did talk about on our Patreon, we've been talking a lot about sewing a lot. <laughs> I think it's because I'm in the middle of a massive craft project of my own. I say craft loosely. I have these two beautiful wing back chairs. They're mid century modern in style, even though they're actually only five years old. And they had the green tweed fabric. And of course, the cats destroyed it within five minutes. And oh, yeah. Then the cats died, and I was like, okay, I can just take a razor blade and save these chairs. But then I got new cats, and then they continued to destroy them. Those are the ones that were across from your couch in the living room, right? Yes. One of them is indeed haunted. Wait, what? Mm -hmm. I was sitting in this chair. Yeah, I always had weird experiences in that chair. So I decided that rather than purchasing new chairs... I would reupholster these. And of course, a lot of people tried to talk me out of it. And I went on YouTube and watched these videos and everyone was like, oh, it's so easy. It cost me $50 and I did it in a weekend. So now we're on week two. And (laughs) (laughs) it hasn't been a damn weekend, has it? No. And I'm almost done with one of them. And it is such a such a nightmare these chairs so many curves and so many pieces of fabric i had to buy 16 yards of fabric i had to drive to two different locations an hour away just to find it all and then the back isn't quite working out so i'm actually doing a corset back on it i actually put corset boning in the edges of the fabric and that had been coiled up it's my sister's and it had been coiled up for like 20 years so (laughs) that's like boing 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 that's tough it's going to be like putting on a real corset getting this thing tightened up probably yeah and also I didn't have any interfacing so I used some old like I think it's a shower curtain liner. These are just like (laughs) Frankenstein chairs man I hope they look better when I'm done with it (laughs) But I have been so frustrated by these things. Everything I'm doing has been borrowed. 
And let me tell you, it is not costing me 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of like, maybe I should have just bought new chairs. Oh, no. I, I was using my sister's sewing machine. And around about 3 p.m. yesterday, I only had three more sections to sew. And the sewing machine just stops. So I just went to Walmart and bought another sewing machine. Oh, my God. I kind of wear my old ass sewing machine from the 60s as like a badge of pride that I can still operate this thing. (laughs) Yeah, I know a lot of people do. But I'm just saying, if I can entice you to come back here to Atlanta. (laughs) So I I can use your sewing machine. (laughs) I have a shiny new sewing machine. We're going to have all sorts of new things. We're going to have new drapes. New tablecloths. I'm going to figure out how to make a rug. (laughs) You're going to buy a loom and weave some cotton into threads. I mean, you already know how to card wool and shear shear sheep. I just need to get a sheep. I'm going to get a sheep for the backyard. (laughs) (laughs) If I come over and there's a sheep in your backyard, I'm going to be thrilled. Please get a sheep. Oh, I don't think my HOA will allow it. What? Sheep are quiet. They'll never notice. It's not like having a goat. That's true. I'd have to fence in the backyard, though. Or just build a moat. (laughs) Sheep-proof moat. Do sheep like swimming? They're kind of like coated in lanolin, so they'd be a little water resistant. This is starting to get a lot more expensive than just buying fabric. (laughs) (laughs) No idea what you're talking about. It sounds like a perfect plan. So I meant to tell you, this chair is haunted that I'm covering. Oh, yes. Back to the relevance. (laughs) So yes, the chair that I'm currently recovering, shortly after we got these chairs, I started having these horrible allergy attacks. And I thought, Uh it's just my time. Every time somebody moves to Georgia, after a few years, they start ending up with horrible allergies. A lot of people I know ended up having to get shots. Like, it just gets bad. I thought it was going to be bad. I went through 18 months of hell, did not sleep a single night all the way through, just woke up with these awful allergy attacks. And what I would do is I would come out into the living room and I would sit in this chair and try to fall asleep sitting up so I wouldn't wake up my husband with all of my sneezing. One time I was curled up in that chair and I felt it was like an icy childlike thing climb into my lap and hold my hand. And I just remember being like, oh, that's sweet. Don't open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. That's sweet. Because oh. <laughs> I knew what was there, but I was so tired and so miserable and maybe a little scared that I was like, I'm just going to let this happen. This little <laughs> girl can hold my hand and comfort me while I'm sad. And then my daughter had that incident where somebody got into this new set of earrings that she had and had taken them all out of their container one by one put the backs on them and set them under the chair in a row. And we found it. So, of course, this is the first chair that I'm doing. And as soon as I pulled all of the fabric off, I had two days of allergy attacks. Uh Oh. Then my son got sick, my husband got sick, and now my sister's sick, who is helping. So I think something was in the chair. Um, yeah. I'm so glad I'm recovering these. Yeah, no shit. It doesn't seem to be coming from the batting. It seems to be coming from the fabric itself. So I don't know what is up with that. I'm just going to call it a ghost because ghosts cause allergy attacks. (laughs) As we all know, it's a fact. Most likely, yeah. It's probably a ghost. (laughs) I hope your chair does not continue to make your family sick. That's terrible. So So do you think when you reupholster it, it won't be haunted anymore? Do you think it'll be even more haunted because you let the ghosts out? (laughs) I let something out. Yeah, I can't wait to get the other one recovered. I hope that your project uh, fixes the evil that dwells within. I hope the new chair enjoys its corset boning (laughs) to make sure I don't tie it too tight. (laughs) Keep it from sneezing. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that next time we get together, we can have a stitch and pitch together. I'll bring over my sewing machine from the 60s. You can bring over your sewing machine and Mm. you'll hear me cussing while you just laugh and laugh. (laughs) <laughs> is your sewing machine from the 60s even portable or is it like built into the wall like it's telephone. built into the wall like a telephone <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it is very portable in fact it's got its own case oh a quilted cover to go over your sewing machine when you're not using it it came with one i've lost it though it's just a chilly sewing machine in my haunted basement 
We're going to be including some images and some other fun things that our guest has shared with us about the story that's upcoming on our Instagram at homespunhaints and on our show notes at homespunhaints.com. So please be sure you check that out because you're going to want to after you hear these stories. They are worthy of a season opener. Let's just put it that way. Oh, yeah. And thank you again to our patrons. And also, please, if you get a chance, check us out on TikTok at Homespun Hates, because we give lots of fun advice about all sorts of things, not just chair upholstery. <laughs> Actually, there's absolutely no advice about chair upholstery on our TikTok. Oh, that okay. would be off brand. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> would it? I'm totally going to show what it looks like, and I'm done. I'm so excited that I did this myself. It'll probably look like a pile of fuming shit to other people fuming <laughs> shit pile of it will probably not look as good to you as it does to me but it's one of those things where i did that so i'm be very proud of myself i'm pretty sure nobody else has a haunted chair dressed in a real bone corset <laughs> that is 100 percent on brand for you becky <laughs> i'm so excited <laughs> that's real corset boning in it <laughs> all right well anyways <laughs> Before we get too out of hand, let's bring on Leon. Have you ever wondered what the top 10 most streamed 90s songs are? Or what about the top 10 highest paid dead celebrities? Hi, I'm Nick, host of the 10-ish podcast, a comedy podcast covering top 10 lists. Every week, me and my various sidekick hosts share trivia, fun facts, and hot takes as we try to guess each other's top 10 lists. Here's a little preview. And it turns out people will just shock a guy to death if someone in a lab coat asks semi-nicely. Chickens outnumber humans more than two to one. It is the only R-rated film to gross a billion dollars. With more than 200 episodes and counting, there's sure to be a top 10 list that tickles your weird little fancy just right. Laugh and learn every week with 10-ish podcast available now on all podcast apps. That's one zero I S H podcast. Today on the show, we have an unusual story to share with you. This has a lot to do with predictions and knowing the future maybe in advance. We're thrilled today to have Leon on the show to share a story with you all. Leon, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to talk to you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. So Leon, can you start from the beginning? You sent a story about, I, I believe it began with you and some friends using a deck of playing cards in sort of a tarot-like fashion. It was in February of 1984. Me and my friend Jim, we lived here in Mojave. We just got out of high school, and we wanted to get out. So he had a sister that lived in Fresno, and he got the idea, hey, let's move to Fresno. We'll hang out at my sister's. We'll hunt for jobs. We'll get a job. We'll get an apartment, and we'll just go from there. We used to play around with divination and stuff, and he had a deck of playing cards. It was just regular playing cards, and he had meanings for each particular card. He had a card that represented him which I think was probably the Jack of Clubs. And I had a card represented me, which was the Jack of Diamonds. Everybody we knew that was in this little small circle had a card that represented them. Jim breaks out the cards. He shuffles them up. And we ask the cards, are we going to find jobs in Fresno? He randomly picks four cards and puts them down in like a plus design. Then he flips them over. The first card was the King of Spades. And that represented a dark-haired male. Second card was the Queen of Hearts. That represented a light-haired female. Third card was the Nine of Spades. And that meant big trouble. The fourth card was the Jack of Diamonds. That was my card. And so we're like, we're reading this. We're like, this doesn't make any sense. It's not even vaguely about what we asked. So he gathers up the cards again, shuffles them up again. Then we ask the question, are we going to get jobs in Fresno? So he randomly picks four cards, places them down like before, flips them over. It's the same four cards. King, King of Spades, <laughs> King of Hearts, 
Nine of Spades, Jack of Diamonds, same four cards. And we're like getting irritated. We're like, no, we want to know if we're going to get Chops and Freds now. <laughs> so again, he shuffles them up and he picks out four cards randomly, face down, flips them over. It's the same four cards. Whoa. And then we're like, okay, something's trying to tell us something. We didn't know where to start. We didn't know who the dark-haired male was. We didn't know who the light-haired female was. We shuffles the cards. We start asking around. If we want to ask yes or no questions, and you drew like a black card, that was a no. A red card represented yes for simple yes or no questions. We start asking about all the dark-haired male and light-haired female couples that we knew. We're like, okay, is it uh, Chrissy and Chuck? And pull a black card. No. Is it Jim and Tandy? Black card. No. So we run out of ideas. And finally I go, is it Tim and Tammy? Red card. Yes. Oh, crap. And the thing is, with them, they were always fighting. He was always cheating on her. He was beating her up. And I was always right in the middle of it. And she began blaming me for it. She told me she didn't want me coming around because every time I did, he started doing that. So, like, I stayed away. We again asked the cards, okay, well, what's the deal, you know? And he pulls out Big Trouble again. And then he pulls out a card that meant traveling. And then my card again. So we asked, like, am I supposed to go to Lone Pine and deal with this? And red card, yes. I'm like, no, I don't want to, right? <laughs> We're getting nowhere. So we just kind of put the cards away, put everything away, and forgot about it. We did wind up going to Fresno. We stayed about three weeks at his sister's place. We kind of sort of hunted for jobs, but not too hard. We just wound up back in Mojave and just did our thing. So that was in February. Now you fast forward to June 12th, 1984. I'm in my bedroom living with my mom she comes into my room. She goes, the sheriff was here. We got an emergency phone call. We didn't have a phone at home. So we had to get in the car and drive to a pay phone. And the sheriff gave her a number to call. So she calls the number. She comes back into the car crying. She said, Timmy shot himself. And his dad wanted me to be a pole bearer. And my head kind of snapped back like somebody hit me, you know. The next day, I saw Tammy, and she was all beat up. She had a black eye and a fat lip and stuff. And I didn't ask any questions. I just kind of hugged her and went to the viewing. And I think the next day, me and his dad and his uncle went and dug his grave. He was half Indian, so he was to be buried on these Indian burial grounds up outside of Big Pine, California. And it was probably about a year or so later, I talked to Tammy about what happened. And she tells me about the abuse he was dishing out and stuff like that. And right before she graduated high school, she finally got the guts to break it off. She dumped him. And she told me when I did that, it's like a, a great weight was lifted off of me. But then she graduated and she went to this graduation party out in the desert. And uh, he shows up in his car. He's like, get in, I just want to talk. Get in, I just want to talk. And so she got in, and they drive, and he takes her out to this remote part of the desert, and he pulls a gun, and he pulls out two bullets and loads it up. He said, this one's for you, this one's for me. And then he beat her up, and I don't know what else. And she's telling me, all I could think of was, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get out of this? And then she got the idea, let's get back together take me home and I'll get cleaned up and we'll go out to eat. So luckily he fell for it. Took her home, dropped her off. She said when she walked in and her mother saw her, her mother called the police. And the police came up and later on he actually drove by to pick her up. And he saw these cop cars parked outside their place and he knew he was in big trouble. So he drove out to the spot where he took her and he took the gun and blew himself away. That's what happened. But none of this event and the cards didn't kick in for a while. It wasn't like immediate. It took a while to make the connection. And then it wrecked me. We grew up together. Like me, Tim, and Tammy all grew up together from when we were little kids. So it was really tough. I made a connection with the cards and it just laid a huge guilt trip on me for years. Because it was like to me, I was forewarned of this event. 
and I didn't do anything. But even if you had connected the things, it doesn't mean you could have done anything to stop it. Right. Yeah, you're right. I was recently talking to another woman about that, and she says, I wonder if something wasn't trying to put you in harm's way. Oh. I never thought of that before, but I guess it's a possibility. Tammy said Tim always got worse when you were around. Well, yeah, because he seemed to always do that stuff when I came around, so she associated it with me. Because he was always cheating on her, especially when I was there. And he was doing it because if there was a girl that I was interested in, he had to swoop down and take her. An ego thing with him. She was in love with the guy, and she couldn't blame him, so I guess I was an easy target. If there was that sort of like extra anger that happened when you showed up, it could mean that you could have been in harm's way, yes, if you'd gone out there. He had two bullets. Yeah. And it was, you know, for him and her, he was serious about it. So was this the one and only time that the cards ever were so spot on? Yes, actually. I mean, we used them a lot and they were always vaguely on track. This is the first time it was like spot on and I'd never seen four cards drawn, randomly drawn, three times in a row. I'd never seen that before. Right, that's truly bizarre. When you got the message before the time passed, back in February, did you interpret it to mean anything? Oh, I definitely did interpret it to mean something. Tim, Tammy, big trouble. And I'm like, gee, what's new? Tell me something I don't know. He had the girl he wanted, but he wanted every other girl he could get his hands on too. And plus, he was abused from the time he was little, and he saw his father do some really bad stuff. So it kind of imprinted on him. Child abuse, the gift that keeps on giving. He saw his yeah. dad beat up his stepmom, and his dad used him like as a punching bag when he was drunk. So it just programmed him to be a monster. It's a shame. I was so envious of, of Tim because he was so talented. He was tall, he was good looking, and then he'd get the girls, get all the girls, like, man, this guy's got it made. Next thing you know, he blows his brains out. And then I think about that woman's comment that maybe the cards or whatever it was behind the cards were trying to put you in harm's way. And that is kind of a possibility because of what was going on around that time. She had two friends in Mojave. They were both named Jim. One Jim was into white magic or Wicca. The other Jim was into black magic. And it was so strange because he was like this devout Christian Bible thumper in school. And then I graduate from high school and he's like complete opposite. He's looking like Charles Manson, dressed all in black. He's carrying a gun. He's doing every drug he can find. He kind of got me and the other Jim into the occult. And again, one Jim was into black magic. The other Jim was gravitating towards white magic. And we all managed to be friends, but I slowly got sucked into the black magic side with the other Jim. And we did our thing. He didn't do much. Mostly he wanted to smoke his pot and talk to the Ouija board. Oh, God. It got boring after a while. But one really weird event happened. We're at the park, maybe around 10 o'clock at night, in his car. He had this old Camaro. And we parked there, and he had his dome light on, which is on the ceiling of the car. And he had it painted blue because that was the devil's color, he said. Well, he sits there, turns off the car, but he turns on the dome light. He pulls out this pipe, and then he pulls out this bag of weed, pulls out a chunk of weed, starts packing his pipe. And he goes, you know, I think my little friends are stealing my weed. His little friends are what he called these little spirit or demon helpers he would tell me about. Okay. Well, right after he said, I think my little friends are stealing my weed, the light in the car goes out. There was a little light bulb in that dome light. It just popped out of its socket. So it went all dark in the car. So he had to put the pipe and everything down. He reaches up with both hands. He takes the lid off the dome light, puts the light bulb back in its socket, and the light comes on. When the light came on, I saw a chunk of weed about 15 inches in the air above his right thigh. Whoa. And then it fell onto his thigh. And he just looks at me and he goes, see? Oh, yeah. what do you think it was that was stealing his weed? It was definitely something. <laughs> he died back in 98. 
before he died, he was dating this girl, and this girl had some children, had some real little children. While he was dating her, she took pictures of her children, and something showed up in those pictures. And I'll email them to you. Is it like in the sixth sense where there's the beam of light or something about the kids? You'll see. I'm thinking maybe it could be his little friends. I'm not sure. But I haven't seen nothing like it before. And after he died, I inherited those pictures, and I've had them ever since. And they're really cool. Now, you go back to the cards and about how whatever was behind it could have may have been trying to put me in harm's way. is because, see, after a while, I broke it off with Jim, who was into black magic. What made me break it off was, one, he wasn't going anywhere with it. He just wanted to talk to the Ouija board and smoke his dope. And he talked about selling the salt to the devil, blah, blah, blah. But it got old. And what really got me out of it was once he was sitting in the front seat with this girl. And they're just sitting in front, just talking away. And I'm in the back seat. It's late. It's probably 10 or 11 o'clock at night or whatever. And I notice a reflection of like a street light in my glasses. And after a while, an image starts to form in that light. And in that image was this great big hand. The hand was red and had these long fingernail type claws and they were black. And there's something in that hand. And in that hand was a man who was dressed in white and the hand kept closing on it, like crushing him. And then it would open up and close on him again and open up and close on him again. And I'm like, I think the dude in that hand is me. <laughs> and so that's when I broke away from Jim, who was into black magic. And I started hanging out with Jim, who was into white magic. And Jim that was into white magic, he could do some cool stuff, too. He'd go in the house, and he could do the coolest stuff with candles. He had these candles burning. Uh -huh. And he'd be across the room, and he'd, like, wave to them. He'd be like, hello. And they would, like, jump up and down. Hello. <laughs> wave again, and they'd jump up and down again. And then talk to the flame. He'd be like, okay, lean to the right. It would actually lean to the right. Okay, lean to the left, lean to the left, get small, and it would get small, get big, it would get big. What's weird is, you know, when I was with Jim that was in the black magic side, we were kind of becoming enemies with Jim that was in the white. Black magic, Jim, he wanted to talk on the Ouija board and smoke his dope, right? And he asked a question, and it's starting to spell out the answer. But I'm like, I wonder if I can make it go to like a B or something like that. And it goes to like the B. I didn't have to push it, it just went there. And I was like, whoa, cool. So from then on, I ran the board. And one day, me and Jim, who's in the black, were at the park, and of course, working the Ouija board. White Magic Jim pulls into the park. He sees us and just pulls right out and takes off. And Jim I was with goes, man, what a snob. And he asked the Ouija board, will you mess up Jim for us? And of course, I controlled the board. And when a direct question like that's asked, a safe answer is always maybe. <laughs> so I was all geared up to move it to maybe. But it went, Fuck. yes. I'm like, I had control except for that one time, right? And that weirded me out, but I couldn't say anything, right? So the next day, I'm at my mom's, and old white magic Jim pulls up into the driveway, and he gets out of his car kind of slow-like. He's like, hey, dude, how's it going? He's like... Got some bad news because my girlfriend just dumped me. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, she was walking towards me and something pushed her back. And then she freaked out, got in her car and split. Like, Whoa. Ooh. He gives me a weird look. He's like, I think you know more about this than you're telling me. I'm like, I don't know nothing. What do I know? And then he just gets in his car and goes home. And she never came back. Well, I'm glad it wasn't something worse. Oh, well, yeah, right. Me too. I'm like, Gee. Yeah, it was a really weird time. If somebody got on our bad side, they kind of got messed up. And then I wound up hanging out with the other gym and got into the white magic stuff. But when that happened, me and the black magic gym kind of became enemies. Like, real bad enemies. Like, it got violent at one point. Did he find out about you controlling the board? Did that have no. something to do with it? No, I never told him. Okay. It's just I dumped the black magic and I went towards the white. And for some reason, we just became enemies, just like 
hated each other. He was always mouthing off. And at one point about beat him up at a party. So I'm thinking is it possible he may have laid a curse on me or something like that. And that may be what was behind the cards to make him try and put me in harm's way. So the incident with the cards happened after all of these stories with the gyms? Right, yeah. You mentioned that other gym wasn't going anywhere, wasn't really bringing his practice to any kind of purpose or point. Was good gym? Did he have goals above and beyond candle tricks? Yeah, we experimented in a lot of stuff, like sending thoughts, receiving thoughts, stuff like that. And I kind of experimented with Jim without him even knowing. We bought books and books and books, and we would experiment using the books. And one of the books I had had experiments in telepathy, how to send and receive thoughts and stuff like that. So I studied it, tried it. Then I decided to try it on Jim, but I didn't tell him. Jim always had a pattern. We drive to the liquor store, we get some Pepsis, and he always had a specific route back home. He'd always take the same route every time. Well, when he gets to this one intersection, he would always turn left. I jump inside his head and I go, turn right. And he turns right. And he goes, why the hell did I do that? <laughs> I told him what I did, and he got pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> the trick to, like, telepathy, sending thoughts, is you have to become that person. It's best to have the person in your line of sight, and it's good to hear their voice. And to send a thought, you have to become, mentally become that person doing exactly what they're doing. Like say you're looking at something or whatever, I gotta pretend I am you and your body doing what you're doing. And I think that attunes the mind. And then you simply send a command, like get a glass of water, sit down, go to the bathroom, go to bed, whatever. And you use their voice too. So you don't ask, will you get a glass of water? No, you command. So they think it's just their thought. So you send that thought, you get in their head, you send a thought, then you purposely forget about it. And if you did it right, they'll do it. But if they're concentrating on something, it's harder to get in. It's when they're in a more neutral state. Like autopilot driving the same route. Yeah. Yeah. So I got in, made the hand, boom, he did it. And then one time we're at my mom's and he goes, okay, let's do that again. Um, I want you to tell me exactly where to go without saying anything okay so he starts driving along and i tell him left turn right turn left turn right turn now it's guiding him all the way across town to a specific location and he was making every turn correctly and we're about three quarters of the way there he's like are we going to christy's house <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so when you're visualizing yourself using their voice with the command is it just the words you're visualizing or are you actually visualizing their body making the turn with the steering wheel yeah, you visualize yourself in their body doing exactly what they're doing. You have to become them just for an instant and long enough to think that thought as them. And if you did it right, it'll work. Boom. And we used to do it a lot in the grocery store to get cuts in line and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait to hear their voice and then be like, I'd jump in and be like, let him go ahead. And then they ask me, you want to go ahead? Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's really fascinating i've been really curious about telepathy and in fact we just did a whole series on telepathy for our private patreon series and never once came across that tidbit that's really fascinating yeah it was it was fun <laughs> probably got some bad karma out of it <laughs> and we could do all this stuff all three of us we could do all this stuff but then at one point it started going away you know, a light is on and off. Whatever was behind all this decided to go away. It went away slowly. More like a dimmer switch, you know, on a light. It's like going, going, going. And we all three noticed it, and we we're all three trying to get it to come back, and it wouldn't. And so our lives became more and more like normal people again. Is this all in 1984? It was really, really hot and heavy in 83. And then it started tapering off around 1984. And like I said, it was a slow taper. Weird stuff were happening all the way to like 1988. But again, it was just tapering. Stuff that we wanted to do purposefully, like the telepathy, the telekinesis thing, all that stuff, just went away. 
It's like we couldn't do it anymore. Why do you think that is? Do you have any theories? I think whatever it was that was behind it all kind of lost interest in us. It's almost like we were an experiment or something like that. And it just gradually went away. Some really bizarre stuff kept happening, but we didn't have control over it anymore. Just oddball stuff would happen all the time. Once in 1994, I was kind of disgruntled at work and wanted to do something different. I just started daydreaming about building a race car. About a week later, a guy at work hits me up and says, Hey, here's an opportunity for you. He goes, Craig Breedlove's building himself a new race car and he needs somebody to help him out. And he hands me his phone number, so I call the guy up. I go to his shop, and he shows me. And he had the basic frame of the car. It was just a steel tubing and stuff like that. And some aluminum panels on it. Then he's explaining what he wants me to do, and he starts talking about this wing he wants me to make for it. And then the image of that wing popped into my head, like so clear you could touch it. I mean, the finished painted part is like flashed. I'm like, wow, I got to do this. And so I did. I took a leave of absence from my job, and I went and worked on building that car until it was finished. About three years. That car was fast. Real fast. (laughs) Got her up to 675 miles an hour. And then it made the world's fastest (laughs) U-turn. On YouTube, actually. It's really cool. Real cool. Do you feel like maybe you are still somehow connected and able to control things, just not in more of like an unconscious level, not really in a conscious way. Yeah, maybe it's unconscious. Do you think that this is something that you had a natural knack for? I'm not sure. Or if it was passed down from my mom because she had something happen too. She'd tell me about these recurring dreams she would have before I was born. In her dream, she'd be at home doing her thing. There'd be a knock on the door. She answers the door and there's a policeman standing there. And he'd tell her, your husband's dead. She had that dream over and over. And she'd also say there was somebody in the background standing in the shadow. She could never make out who it was. Well, one day she got that knock on the door. And a policeman informing her, your husband's dead. He got in a car accident. Him and his brother died at the same time. I think they hit a train or something. They were both in the Navy and they were on leave. I think maybe they tried to beat the train or something, but they lost. And it killed them both. And that was seven months before I was born. He didn't even know I was coming. She was going to tell him when he got home, but he never got home. So she named me after him. I mean, there's some more weird stuff I could tell you. At least one of them's way off the charts. Have you ever heard of a thought form? A thought form, it's an, almost like an artificial being, but it's created by thought, by your thoughts alone. Oh, kind of like a tulpa? Yeah, yeah, exactly like a tulpa. Same thing. Okay. Well, I'm sure I accidentally made one. And my friend Jim, who was in White Magic, contributed to that because we were both focused on this one character that I made up. It's a character I completely made up. So we used to play Dungeons and Dragons, right? And in this game, you make up these characters and you make up a backstory and a history about them and you play them out and you start to care about them. And But they get killed and you get like bummed out because like, oh, the character's dead. Sometimes people cry. They care about their characters. Well, this one character I made up, he was like insanely lucky. Everything's based on a roll of a dice. The dice decide who lives and dies, like in combat and stuff like that. I've had one character whose luck was so bad, he died again, again, again. Then another character whose luck was so good, he get these perfect rolls again, 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 again. And these weird coincidences were happening with them that made me think, ooh, maybe he built up a thought form or a tulpa. And my character is just getting more and more insanely powerful in the game. And more and more stuff was happening here. At one point, I started seeing this girl named Kathy. It was at a point where people were dying around me a lot. And so I told this thing, or thought form, or tulpa, if you will. I told it, I go, when I'm not around Kathy, I want you to watch her. It was just an experiment on my part. That's all I said. Watch her when I'm gone. And then I kind of forgot about it. Well, we'd hang out. And one night, me and Kathy are in her bedroom watching TV. And I got hungry, so I went to get a snack. Got some chips. I came back in, and Kathy's, like, scared. She goes, the moment you left, I felt something watching me. 
And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then after that, every time I left, she's like, every time you leave, I feel something watching me. And so one night I'm like, okay, try and focus on it. Tell me all about it that you can get. What kind of form is it in? And she goes like, it's a male. Okay. And he's tall. Like, yeah. He says he's muscular or buffed. Yeah. And he's, he's like, they were all hits. Character was tall, six foot two. He was muscular. And she goes, there's something like royalty or something about him. And it's like, in the game, he was a god. Okay. Can't get much more royal than that. Okay. And it just kept going on, going on. Then one night, we spent the night in Kathy's living room on the floor for some reason. And uh, I got up, went to work in the morning, and she called me. She goes, the moment you left, I felt that being watched really strong again. And she's still laying on the floor. She goes, and then I heard it walk up to me. She says, I heard it walk up to me. Then she goes, I got really scared, and I pulled the covers over my head. Then she goes, it pulled them down. <gasps> yeah. And then she goes, then I remembered all the stuff you taught me about telepathy and stuff. She tried to communicate it. She goes, asking questions. Who are you? What are you? And I go, did it answer? She goes, yeah, it answered one question. I go, what was the question? She goes, I asked it, how old are you? And she says, it said, I am as old as you are. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. I go, what did it sound like? I go, did it sound like me? I am as old as you are. She goes, no. I go, did it sound like this? I am as old as you are. She goes, no. Then I used the character I invented. I used his voice. And it was, I am as old as you are. And she goes, that's almost exactly what it sounded like. And I'm like, wow. Whoa. Wow. I didn't tell her what it was because I was experimenting. I was just trying to gather more information. She said, and then it would follow her other places, like to her mom's and stuff like that. And she says a dog saw it and chased after it and ran into the wall. But then me and Kathy just kind of drifted apart. And I haven't seen her in like 30 years. So I don't know what became of it. It just kind of maybe dissolved or something like that. Still watching. You know, thought forms and stuff like that, while well, you're focused on them, and, and it's almost like you're charging a battery. As long as you're focused on them and you're feeding your motion into it, you'll create a thought form. But when you stop focusing on them, you stop thinking about them, that battery drains slowly, and they will just dissipate. And I think that's what's happened. Okay. That was that. <laughs> wow. My mind is warping right yeah. now. That's a lot to take in. Leon, those were some incredible stories. I told y'all it was going to be different <laughs> yeah. from what we've heard before. So this was this was awesome. I thought you were going to be telling us a story about some cards, and it just... You have so much more than that to tell. So what an incredible series of events and life's experience, Leon. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thank you. You all have been listening to Leon on Homespun Haints. He is going to share some photos with us, and we are going to post those on our show notes at homespunhaints.com and also on our Instagram profile at homespunhaints, so you can take a look at those there. Also, for those of you that want to support our show, please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash homespunhaints, where you can listen to this and all episodes and bonus episodes ad-free. Leon, thank you yet again for, for reaching out to us and sharing your stories with us. I'm going to have quite a lot to think about on this right? one. I have D&D Thursday night. And I'm going to have to try really hard to create a tulpa or not create one. <laughs> 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 that was a great story. I mean, that was many, many, many great stories. I hope someday I have any one of those bizarre telepathy-based experimental experiences myself i've been trying god knows i tried so far i've i've yet to have that much of a spooky day homespun haints is hosted by becky kilimnik and diana doty and produced by homespun haints media llc editing and music by becky kilimnik show notes by diana doty if you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit.